grace is a gift because the work has been done. If the, wor if the work's not done, then the work has to be done in order for it to be completed. But you see, the work has been completed. Therefore, you enter into God's grace rest. You say, and it's, it doesn't require any work from you. You understand that? It's a gift. See, so that's in Ephesians 2.8 in, in the New, New Testament. All right? Now, once you learn that, and I saved it up to the last, when you read this little phrase that we've read, and it was so, on each day, he, he, he writes in verse 7, verse 9, 11, 24, and 30, it's translated in the English, it was so. But we know there's no it. It should be translated as it is in the Hebrew Bible. He. He. He was so. Now what's interesting is the word so. It's an adverb. You can see that. It's an adverb. It's the word... It's a word, ken, K-E-N. And the idea is very simple. The idea that's used over and over and over again, and it was so. When he completes a day, he says, and it was so. What he's referring to, and I wrote it on your paper, the idea in the Hebrew of the word so is it occurred it occurred just as God had prescribed or described. That takes us back, and I told you that when we went through it, it takes you back to the Eternal Life Conference. It takes you back to the Eternal Life Conference where he laid out the plan of God, and now it's being fulfilled or completed. And we enter into that whole process. By the time we get to the New Testament, we're now talking about what was prophetically being discussed in the word him, being Christ, we now know that we have a, a human term for him, Jesus Christ, the man of the incarnation. See, where did that prophecy really come from? It really started in Genesis 2-3. That's a messianic prophecy. Okay? Those who are going through our, our ten timelines, this lesson needs to go into needs to go into that. This is a messianic off the first timeline. So you want to put this study in that section uh, for you. So it's just kind of interesting. Uh, there is no neuter in the Hebrew. So you have to pay attention. It's it's either male or female. The other thing that's important that we miss is a, is a distinction between the seventh day and the, and, the, and the Sabbath. There is a marked distinction between the seventh day. See, we've been one, two, three, four, five. See, that's an ordinary number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it, the seventh day is a number, a number, but the word rest is a word. Yeah. See, a lot of people don't realize that. I wrote the Hebrew word for seventh out, ordinal number, in the series of Day of the Creation Restoration. Notice the word Sabbath. It's a different word. That's a verb. That's a verb. Shabbat is a verb. It is the Hebrew word for rest, R E S T. It was used on the seventh day of creation to introduce. The eternal rest of God, watch this now, through sanctification in Christ. 
Look at verse, look at, look at verse 3, because we, we, we tend to miss words. I mean, Genesis 2, 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So, but it's not sanctified it, it's what? Him. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified him. Because in him, God rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. You say to me, Ron, how do you know that? Well, I know it from Hebrew. But how do we know he's referring to him in reference to Christ? Agreed? So hold, let's hold our place in Genesis and let's go to Mark. We did this last week, but apparently it can't be done enough. So we'll, we'll keep doing it until we get it. Mark, the second chapter, 27, 28. This is what Jesus said. He makes comments on this very issue. He certainly understood that the him was him. That the him referred to the Messiah, Christ. Here's what it says. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath, what's the difference between that word Sabbath and the word rest on your Bible, on your page? Is there a difference? Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. I'm going to tell you again. Up there when I gave you the Hebrew word for Sabbath, look at it. That's the verb. What's different with that than the one that's used by Jesus? There's a difference, people. What's the difference? Well, it is. He doubled, he doubled the bat, he doubled, he doubled the B. That's a dogish forte in Hebrew. That's a doggish forte in Hebrew, and that's a big deal. When you put that dot in a second letter, in a second consonant of the word, it doubles the letter and intensifies the meaning. You understand that? In Genesis 2-3, it's S-H-A-B-T-H. When Jesus interpreted it, he doubled the B. S-A-B-B-A-T-H. Please tell me you see that. Where did he get that? He got it from the Mosaic system of Sabbaths. This is why you go, this is why you go to this church. This is why you, this is why lo the Lord has drug you into here, <laughs> has brought you into here. This is basic 101 Hebrew. I am not talking anything out of basic 101 Hebrew. Any, any first year Hebrew student knows what I just told you. They know about the Dagish Forte in the second consonant, doubles it, intensifies the meaning. Okay, now here's what Jesus said in Mark 2, 27, 28. The Sabbath, and he's talking about a, the entire Mosaic Sabbath system, and I'm going to talk about that today. I'm going to lay it out to you. Was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. Why? So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's, what it's be, that's what's being prophesied in Genesis 2-3. And Jesus is fulfilling that. And not, listen to me now, this is so important. Not, as a, not only is he, he fulfilling Genesis 2-3, but he's, he, he, he is completing the entire Mosaic Sabbath system. Jesus is fulfilling bringing to completion the work is done to the entire Mosaic Sabbath system. And it was huge. 
Moses doubled the second consonant, radical, or they call it consonants or radical, doubled it. He doubled it and developed an entire God, developed an entire Sabbath system recorded in the Mosaic writings. And Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ, is going to bring all of that into completion in him because he's the Lord of the what? <laughs> yeah, he is. Is it got two bees in it? Yeah? That's enough to have a fruit farm. All right. So let's take a look at a few points on the subject matter to show you what a dynamic idea this is of prophecy fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Point number one. The seventh day was blessed and sanctified. The seventh day was blessed because in him Christ, fallen man, Adam's original sin, can find rest for his soul. That's the great prophetic promise. Genesis 2.17, don't eat of the tree. He ate of the tree, boom. This is discussed by Paul, of course, in Romans 5, 12 through 21. It is carrying out the whole prophecy of Genesis, the Messianic prophecy of Genesis 2, 3. Do you agree that there's a Messianic prophecy there? Oh my goodness, I just proved it. Listen, there's more. Listen, I could, you, you could read the book of Hebrews. The Hebrew, this fourth chapter says it. Hebrews, the 10th chapter says it. You could read the book of Hebrews if, you, if, you, you know, if you're really interested in having justification of what I'm teaching you. You should read that. Okay? Listen, what Jesus says in, in Matthew 11 on this very subject, of Sabbath rest. He says to the Jew, in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 31, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Yeah, see, that's the rest we're talking about. Where, where is the only place you can find rest Sabbath rest. Where can, where's the only place you can find it? In him who is Christ. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Why does their soul need rest? Because... It's weary and heavy laden by trying to carry a law they can't complete, they can't fulfill. He's talking to Jews who are under a damning sin that only Christ can remove and they're carrying the law thinking that the law can do it. The law was never intended to do it. It was intended to point us to Christ is the only one who could do it. Galatians 3.24 I will give you rest. I will give rest to your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus with confidence can say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. What an enormous boast, but it's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis 2, 3. Well, isn't that interesting? In Mark 7, 27 and 28, Jesus referred to the Sabbath with the doubling of the bee. Agreed? It's, it's, not, not, it's not in Genesis 2, 3. But it is in Mark 2, 27, 28. Here's point number two. By doubling the bath, 
that's the bee, into a doggish forte of Sabbath, the word rest. When he doubled the B, he took it out of a verb and put it into a noun. When he doubled the B. Uh, hey, Chris, you want to pop that for me? Oh, there you go. Okay. Can, can I pop it? No. Just to... You're going to have to take my word. I can't write the Hebrew word up. All right? I, can't, I, can't, I, don't, I don't have the whereabout thing. So. Now watch. Here's the Sabbath. That when he doubled the B, Moses is now going to create, by the authority of God, an entire Sabbath system. Do you understand that? By doubling the B... He's going to take that prophecy and he's going to expand it enormously in the law. He's going to show you so much of Christ in the law that you couldn't miss him. And yet the Jews did. Not only did they miss him, but listen, they, they, they killed him. Now, I'm talking about their intent, not God's. When I say they killed him, I'm talking about their intent, not God. You should read Hebrews 10, 1 through 18. Not now, but you ought to read it. I'm going to read one verse. I maybe read two verses. I don't have time to read it all to you. Listen to this. Here's, here's Hebrews 10, 1. For the law, that's the Mosaic law, and especially, I'm focused on this Sabbath system right now, this entire Sabbath system of Moses. For the law, since it was only a shadow, that's shadow Christology, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of the things, can never, can never shrink. Wait, got the wrong page. By the same sacrifice which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Then he goes on to discuss this subject. Drop down to verse 10. Drop down to verse 10. You're going to read all this. By this will, verse 9, and then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first covenant in order to establish the second covenant, which you and I are under. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There's your connection with sanctification in Genesis 2-3 to your very life. Sanctified in Christ. See, for the law, he's talking about the Mosaic law. And he's, he's showing you the entire Sabbath system. He's, he's winding up the whole Sabbath, Mosaic Sabbath system. Well, you've got to read the Bible. Look, if I can get your head in the Bible, my tour on earth has been successful. And if I can get you your head in the Bible, this has been a vain exercise for me with your life. You need to study the Bible. You don't study it enough. The Bible has all the answers to your problems. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And faith is the way you solve your problems. You got to know that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Whether you hear it by reading or hear it by speaking. Boy, you've got to do this. That's why I'm in Moody. This is my passion for your life. Now, watch, watch the Mosaic Sabbath. Said, Let me show it to you. Now, Moses wrote five books, and I've covered it in one point. You understand? <laughs> That's not fair to Moses. 
but I'm working with a whole generation that's about the best I can do with you. Until you just have a desire to study the Bible, not just in church, but out of church. Because church is always on in your life, agreed? Your body's the temple of God, the Holy Spirit. He's the great teacher of the Word of God. How can that not be? Well, here we go. Watch his system. This is a system that Moses developed in his five books. He developed, here we got a weekly Sabbath. We're familiar with that. That's the seventh day. Exodus 28 through 11, it's the seventh day of the week. We're all familiar with that. Watch this. There's a Sabbath year. There's a Sabbath year. Every seventh year is a Sabbath year. A Sabbath year. You know, people talk about a lot of universities, they offer sabbatical leaves. Every seventh year, they give them a year to go and work on their... Um, their um, do it again. Doctor. Well, their doctor or they're in their field, a special expertise in their field. Um, so we have, and I, I gave you, I gave you where it's located in the Bible, Exodus twenty-three. You know, you always read them, don't you? Because my numbers can sometimes be crazy, so you always look that stuff up. Um, so we have a Sabbath year, a sabbatical. We have. Seven sabbatical weeks, they called it the Feast of Weeks, we call it Pentecost. This is seven complete weeks, and on that very next day, you go seven Sabbath weeks, and on the very next day, the 50th day is the fulfillment. So you have that. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's called the Feast of Weeks. I gave you scripture for that. You have a sabbatical jubilee. That's this taken the seventh to this to the fiftieth year. That's taken the Sabbath weeks all the way to the like we did with Pentecost, with uh, with we, now we take it to years. All right. You're, pro you're probably familiar with these ideas. You've, you've, if you've sat in churches long enough, you've probably heard some of these, but nobody's kind of put it in a, uh, an envelope for you, you know, where you just read it and say, oh, wow, I see that. Uh, hopefully, I've just done that for you. And, and you'll look some of this stuff up. Now, one of the things that's really important to the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is what's called high Sabbaths. In Leviticus 23, God set out seven national holidays for the Jews. In these seven, it, it all include the coming of Christ. They were identities with the coming of Christ. However, we know that these seven are divided in the first coming and in the second coming. The first four of the Sabbaths in Leviticus 23 have to do with the first coming of Christ and the last three with the second coming of Christ. When they were written, they were just looking for the coming of Christ. There was no idea of a separation of time in biblical history called the church age. That was the mystery doctrine. Now, when you come to the when you come to the week of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you're in the, you're right in the middle of, of national Sabbaths. Now watch this. Passover, Passover always was on the 14th of Nisan. That's a date, not a day. Like Christmas. Christmas is on a date, not a day. Agreed? Yeah, of course. Fourteenth, you always celebrated Passover on the fourteenth of Nisan, according to the Mosaic Law, and then next seven days you were in what was called unleavened bread festival. 
So these two Jewish festivals were, was connected in an eight-day celebration. And they celebrated the coming of Christ to become our Savior, and not only ours, but the Savior of the world. So on the 14th of Niacin, Christ is going to be hung on a cross. The very next day, 15 through 21, is unleavened bread. 14 is Passover. 15 through 21 is unleavened bread. That Sometimes that whole eight days is called unleavened bread. Sometimes it's called Passover. They were connected. Do you understand that? Now listen to me. The first day of unleavened bread and the last day of unleavened bread, which is the 14th and 21, 15 and 21. You understand that? These, these are dates, not days. Agreed? We're high Sabbaths. They're called high Sabbath or holy convocations. They were viewed just like a Sabbath. Whatever was required about a Sabbath was required on those days. So we're going to have Christ in the grave, 15, 16, 17. And he's going to be out on Sunday, the 18th. You understand that? Now you can count your days back and figure out when he died. Agreed? Because we, we got a definite date. But we're only in day 18 of how many days of unleavened bread? 21. But we're only in 18. He's out of the grave on the 18th, and we're, we're celebrating. Agree? <laughs> right? Nobody ever pays any attention. We still have one more day. We have one more time, the 21st, and that's going to be a holy convocation. Agreed? It's going to be a high Sabbath. Are you paying attention? What day is that in the week? If 18th is, 18th is Sunday, agreed. What's the 21st? Can we all get on agreement of what day that is? Okay. I thought I was bad at math. <laughs> as long as I got my fingers, I can, get, I can figure out with my fingers. Now listen to me. Do you know why the church... The two days that traditionally the church of Jesus Christ throughout church history, the two days they have met, Sunday and, do you know why? Because they studied the Bible and said, well, that would be a good thing. Okay? Now, it's not written in stone. You can be, because all the days, all the days are holy days in Christ. They're, they've been blessed and sanctified, agreed, in him. Yeah, so you can meet any time you want to. But traditionally, the church has always honored two days. Now it's become part of tradition. Nobody knows where it came from. Okay. It's not written in stone, so don't get mad. If we don't meet on Wednesday, and others do, uh, it don't make you, what makes you, holy or sanctified is Christ. All right. Just, just kind of filling in some blanks. Now, watch this now. Watch this now. On the 18th Sunday, we call it Sunday, that they call it the first day of the week. Right? What we call Sunday, they call it the first day of the week. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and do it. 1 Corinthians 16. Just kind of show you where church history moves us. Oh. 1 
1 Corinthians 16. In verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 16, 2, He's talking about, well, let me just read one and two. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so, so, so do you also. And they're collecting, it's a mission program. They're, they're supporting missions, for, for lack of a better, rather than getting a whole lot of history. On the, watch this. On the first day of every week, what do we call that first day? We call it Sunday. Huh? They call it the first day of the week. Where did the church get the idea that the first day of the week is the most celebrated day of the church? Because of the resurrection of Christ. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save as he has prospered so that no collection is made when I come. Okay? Okay? You could read, you could read, uh, hopefully, <laughs> Revelation 1.10. Just showing you some, I'm just showing you some history of the, why we do what we do uh, as a church. 1.10, 1, 10. Uh, John is going to write the book. Here's what he says. If I get, I mean, get out of chapter two and get into one, John says, as he as uh, as he opens up the Pathmuth vision on the island of Pathmuth, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What, what day do you think he's talking about? The Lord's day. That's what we call Sunday, or they call it the first day of the week. Well, anyhow. Now, let's let's go back. Here's the here's the week of the crucifixion of Christ. Agreed? He he's he's he's, resu he's resurrected on 18. In that week, it's on the 18th. Right? This the first day, the first day after the weekly Sabbath. See the 18th? That's the first day of the week. You know what the day 17th was? It's a weekly Sabbath. Do you understand it? The week he was crucified, that's a weekly Sabbath. The very next day, because it's, it's part of the unleavened bread ceremony, the very, the very next day, on the 18th, when he's raised from the dead, raised from the dead, it's called, for the, the Jewish had a festival called First Fruits. It's a, all of this is in Leviticus 23, has first fruits. You counted, you count seven weeks, and on the 50th day, you have Feast of Weeks. We call it Pentecost, Acts 2. And four of the seven national holidays talking about Messiah have been fulfilled at Pentecost, and the church comes into existence to prepare for the second coming of Christ. Is that not something? You couldn't, you couldn't make this stuff up. This is so good. Dear hearts, why would you not trust God with your life and all of the messes in it? Why would you not? Listen, What's he say? Is that bring your weary, struggling, messed up heart to me and I will do what? I'll give you rest. Come and put it on me. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 8, something like that, where he says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. I'm a, I'm a burden-carrying Messiah. Not only do I take care of your sins, I take care of your problems. Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful Savior we have, people. What a wonderful Savior. Well, anyhow, just trying to show you what Moses set up was all about him, right? All about Christ. The whole Sabbath system 
was to point you to Christ in the most magnificent way and to show you what all he had to fulfill, not just on the cross, but connected to it. Right? A whole lot of stuff went on that week. A whole lot of stuff that had to go on, had to be fulfilled to complete our salvation. Jesus in John 19.30, when he said on the cross it was finished, do you understand that you enter a finished work? The moment you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, do you know that when you believe that, you enter into a completed work of salvation? That's why Paul says, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself, it is a gift. Not of works. The work's been done. The common word that's used in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, is the word work completed. Yeah. All right. God provided, provided point three, God provided a grace way of entrance into his eternal rest by sanctification in Christ. This God blessed the seventh day and sanctified him because in him he rested from all of his work which he had created and made. God rested all of it in his son. And when you go to his son, you get all that God has rested in him. And that's a whole lot, dear hearts. God blessed the seventh day because he had provided a grace way for mankind to enter into his eternal rest. Therefore, the seventh day became connected theologically with the eternal rest of God through sanctification in Christ. That's when you should read Hebrews 10. You should read that. Here is Paul's idea in 1 Corinthians 6.11. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. Or in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about, if, listen, we're talking about in, in human terms, we're talking about the creation story. But when we're talking about the creation story, we're talking about the eternal life conference of God, Ephesians 1.4. You should begin to be able to start putting your dots together in this magnificent thing called grace salvation. It is, it is beyond what you could possibly ever imagine, and it is so much more than what you think you have. You have so much more than what you think you have. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Point four, mankind enters into God's eternal rest by means of faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we who have believed enter that rest, Hebrews 4, 3. And of course, our standard uh, remarks about the gospel. You should read Hebrews 4, 1 through 10, as well as Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. Here's Hebrews 4, 6. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had the good news gospel preached them failed to enter. Yeah? Listen, there's still room on the ark. <laughs> there's still plenty of room. But listen, you're not going to go to heaven. You are not going to go to heaven apart from Christ. Christ came into this world. He died on that cross. He was buried and raised to give you life eternal. And the moment you believe, you enter into the completed work of rest for your soul. That's positional truth. The one who enters his rest, here's, here's Hebrews 4.10, the one who, who, who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work 
as God did from his. And as you can't, you can't, you, the salvation deal is over. Now it's a matter of the Christian way of life serving God. Not for salvation, but for victory. And of course, one of the great passages, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Let me close today with this. Jesus Christ fulfilled shadow Christology of the old covenant. The entire mosaic system has been fulfilled. He did this through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Paul wrote in Romans 4.10 that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Boy, how true that is. Hebrews 10.14 For by one offering he has perfected or completed for all times those who are sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 By this where we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The church age believer under the new covenant historical Christology, here is a promise when he said a new covenant has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. The writer of Hebrews Therefore, the church age believer does not observe old covenant law system of shadow Christology. Here's what Paul wrote in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink in respect to festivals, the national holidays, or new moons, or Sabbath day. A lot of people still do that. They're warned not to. Things which are mere shadows of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And I give you other passages. The reason we give you a handout, we don't expect you to be able to grasp this in one session. It will take some time to digest it, to study it, to come to grips with your own life, because faith comes to each individual by hearing and hearing the Word of God. We start the ball rolling, only you can keep it. Only you can come to this kind of conclusion. Scriptures should take you there. The Scriptures should take you there. So our Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us by the automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth that we have laid out today as we study the scriptures and begin to see and realize that we have been blessed and sanctified in Christ, which was a fulfillment of the prophecy that goes back to the founding in Genesis 2-3. Take this offering, Father. Make us good stewards for it in Jesus' name. Amen.